So now uh, next up is we're on schedule. So at 10 o'clock, we are going to have a series of presentations by the Maltese National Contact Point on Horizon Europe, the newly launched largest funding program in Europe. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, can someone confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I'm there. Okay. So um, thank you very much for uh, inviting us today to be part of uh, the grant. Um, unfortunately, the NCPs could not uh, be present with you physically today, but uh, this is due to the fact that this week um, we are all attending a series of information and training events um, organized by, by the Commission and other NCP networks. So we are literally in and out of uh, sessions all week this week. But uh, of course, uh, I hope you will find this presentation useful. So all the NCPs are coming in to present the areas which uh, we all represent. Um, and of course, if there are any other questions, any further questions, we can always organize a further sessions or one-to-one -one meetings with anyone who is interested to speak to us further about these uh, funding opportunities. This is a brief uh, outlook of what we will be presenting to you today. So we'll just we'll give you a, an introduction to the Horizon Europe program. Um, the participation criteria and uh, the types of actions available, the costs, which costs are eligible and which costs are not. Then all the NCPs will come in and briefly present um, the areas which we represent. Um, we are going to give you a live demonstration of the funding and tenders portal, so we can help you navigate through this portal portal to find all the opportunities which uh, you will be looking for. We'll give you some pointers on how to find partners and on proposal writing, um, the application and evaluation services, and then we'll speak about what um, MCST um, does as national contact points and also about our role as program committees. With regards to proposal writing, may I draw also your attention that this week um, on Thursday, we are organizing a physical um, writing session, proposal writing session, focusing on collaborative projects um, here at MCST. And then on Friday, we have another session which will focus specifically on the Marie Curie actions um, Marie Curie actions, actually. So if you are interested in attending of uh, any of those sessions, um, you can speak to us directly, um, speak, send us an email or an NGO also there has all the information available um, so she can help you um, how to register for these sessions. So this is an overview of the structure of Horizon Europe. As you can see, um, Horizon Europe has maintained the more or less the same structure as Horizon 2020. So we have pillar one, which focuses on excellence science. I will not go into detail um, about each of these areas because as I mentioned, all the NCPs are here present and we will give you more information about that. And also um, as the pro-rector mentioned earlier, there are dedicated sessions this week on the European Research Council and on the Murray Sklodowska Curie actions um, under Pillar 1. Then in Pillar 2, um, we have the global challenges. So where in Horizon um, 2020, the focus was more on, uh, on the societal challenges. Now we have global challenges and then Pillar three um, focuses on uh, innovative, innovative Europe. So here the focus is on uh, 
on the disruptive technology um, and the priority here is given to the European Innovation Council where the majority of budget is, is focused. Then we also have cross-cutting areas like the widening um, and strengthening the European research area. The widening area is a very important area for Malta. Um, we unfortunately are a widening country, so we are a low performing research and innovation country. So in these actions, these, are, these actions are specifically designed for low performing countries like Malta. And then um, on the side, we have the Eurotem program and also the European Defence Fund program. So for the participation criteria, the basic rule um, for most of, of the program is that you will need three legal entities from three different member states or associated countries. Regarding associated countries, um, most of the, the associated countries um, which were associated to Horizon 2020 are currently negotiating their association agreements. So most of them, and this includes the United Kingdom, they will be associated countries to Horizon 2020. The only country um, which might not, it's still undecided, the commission is still uh, in discussions with, with Khan, is Switzerland. So just be careful when you are including Switzerland because it, is, it can be considered as a third country for the first calls of, of Horizon Europe. Um, as I mentioned, this is the basic rule for most of, of the calls because then you might have different um, criteria which apply for the EIC, European Innovation Council, for example, Accelerator, different rules for uh, the European Research Council, and uh, different rules for the Marie Sklodowska reactions. And also um, CSAs, um, coordinated and support actions, here the requirement is minimum um, one legal entity. But also when you are um, looking to participate into Horizon Europe, make sure you read the, the call text um, really well because there might be different criteria which would specifically apply for that for that call another point i would like to mention is that from 2022 um, the gender equality plans will be um, a requirement for all public bodies and research organizations and also higher education institutions so this includes the university of malta to be eligible to participate in uh, in calls from 20, with uh, deadlines in 2022, um, the institution, the entity, has to have these gender equality plans um, in place. Um, last week we organized a webinar on this on this uh, specific thing criteria. Um, so you can either refer back to uh, this webinar, uh, which is on our YouTube channel, or else just contact us directly and we will be more than happy to provide you with uh, information on how to go about this uh, gender equality plans. Types of actions. Um, we have mainly three main types of actions. Again, there will be different criteria, for example, for the Marie Curie actions, for the AIC and for the ERC. But the collaborative projects um, for under pillar two, they fall within these three main actions, where we have the research and innovation actions, um, where the funding rate goes up to 100%, and the minimum criteria, again, is three um, legal entities from three member states or associated countries. Then we have the innovation actions. Um, here, the funding rate is 70%, but it can go up to 100% for non-profit legal entities. And then we have the coordinated and support actions. As I mentioned, these are not specific research actions um, and the minimum criteria here would be one beneficiary. But of course, these are the minimum criteria and the commission would expect that more beneficiaries join these, these networks. Overall, um, over and above these funding rates, then you have 25% indirect costs 
um, for all eligible costs, you have 25% overheads. What costs are eligible? Um, uh, personnel costs. So you can pay all your employees working on the project, um, uh, but they have, of course, to have a contract on that specific project. Um, so everyone working uh, on that on the project is eligible to is eligible to get paid. You have subcontracting costs. It's also an eligible cost. Um, purchasing purchasing uh, for travel and subsistence. Also, you can purchase some equipment with uh, with direct costs and other goods, works or services um, which can be funded by from the action. And then there are other cost categories. Um, I will not go into details here because it can uh, take us a whole day to, to explain all these different uh, cost categories. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there are also the 25% indirect costs for all eligible costs, which is applied um, over and above the eligible costs. I will now pass the floor to uh, my colleague, Ian, the NCP for widening and for health. So we will start going through the areas and all the clusters one by one. Thank you, Montea. And, and as, as Santia rightly said, I am the NCP for widening participation for research infrastructures and for health. Um, as already mentioned, widening participation is, is a very important area for Malta. This is because Malta falls into the, into the category of widening countries. What do we mean by widening countries? So basically, when we talk about widening countries, I can tell you that it's it's the, the, the member states that joined the European, the European Union from 2004 till today, plus Greece and Portugal. So um, over the next seven years, uh, these countries are expected to be um, considered the widening countries. And these are all countries which fall in the category of low performing R&I uh, economies. So um, there are specific actions um, to help them scale up a little bit um, their, their research and innovation. And there is specific funding and calls um, specifically that is designed for, for their participation. Um, widening participation and strengthening the European research area um, is a cross-cutting uh, pillar across the whole program. It is made up mostly of um, different schemes designed for a bottom-up support. So there is no specific team or 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 um, or subject area which which um, is called for under this 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 pillar. If I can call it a pillar. Um, there are these schemes, you apply to the scheme and you can apply in any area that, that, that you deem um, is necessary for, for your project. Uh, the total budget is 3.1 billion euros um, for, the, for the entire seven years. And the work program of 2021 and 2022 has a, budget, a combined budget of 674 million euros. Um, and it's split up into three different areas, three destinations. So. Now you will see that, that, that as we start uh, presenting the different clusters and the different areas of the program, you will understand that, that these calls are split up all into destinations, what we call destinations. These are sort of, uh, they refer to, to a set of calls in, 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 within the area. Next slide. So these are the three areas. Um, the, first, the, the first destination is about uh, improving access to excellence. And here you will find uh, schemes such as teaming, for example. Teaming um, is, is a scheme whereby um, you can team up with another world-class leading institution um, and you can exchange know-how and transform your faculty, for example, into a center of excellence. Um, the second scheme is, is about twinning, um, and here um, again you can team up with 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 another institution in a non-widening country um, to exchange expertise, for example, to exchange information, exchange of data, etc. You'll also find schemes such as the excellence hubs. Um, here again, here you have the um, you need to set up a consortium of um, different actors, such as, for example, academia, public entities, um, 
private entities and 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 also uh, associations or NGOs. Then there's European Excellence Initiative, but unfortunately the University of Malta is excluded from this uh, call because uh, you have already benefited through the university's package. So um, for this this work program, you are not eligible. Uh, and then there is also a, a new feature in the program which did not exist under Horizon 2020, which is the Hopon facility. And here, um, I just want to say that if um, you identify a project, um, maybe in two years time or three years time, which is of direct interest to you, and there is no widening country in that project, um, there could be a possibility for you to hop on to this project, even though it's already funded, and you will receive funded funding just as a normal beneficiary would do uh, in the project. Then going on to, to the other destinations, um, Destination two is about attracting and mobilizing the best talents. And here you will find uh, schemes specifically targeting uh, the talent of the individual. So, um, and also as an institution. So it will, it will also give the University of Malta um, the visibility it needs um, by applying through, through the ERA chairs, for example, um, the ERA fellowships, which is a kind of an extension of the Marie Curie Slodowska actions which um, um, is targeted specifically for widening countries and also the era talents. Destination three is about reforming and enhancing the European research uh, and innovation system. And here all the, the, the schemes or, or the calls um, are targeted towards um, uh, providing the right framework conditions for um, the research system to, to flourish. Uh, here you will find calls such as, for example, targeting research ethics, gender equality, and also there is also a lot of help on for for the setting of the of the gender equality plans, which Shantea mentioned before, reforms in the research systems, implementation of open science practices, for example. So, so, so here you'll find these targeted calls, um, uh, which which can also help you um, to to create the right conditions for your researchers to apply further to other parts of the program. Next slide. So uh, the second area that I take care of is research infrastructures. And if you recall um, the structure of the whole Horizon Europe, you will notice that uh, pillar one is consisting of the European Research Council, the Marie Curie Actions, and research infrastructures. So this is one of the, 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 the kind of Mini pillars of pillar one. Um, here you will find calls um, which give uh, access to research infrastructures, uh, better access, improving the, the research infrastructures which already exist, and also to prepare for new ones. Um, there is a, a total combined budget of 2.4 billion euros. Most of the calls are all uh, bottom up in pillar one. So again, like the widening participation, there is no topic or team um, that is dictated from 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 for the call, but um, it's it's mostly a bottom up uh, call. In 2021 and 2022, the combined budget is of 550 million, and it is split up into five destinations. I apologize for the very busy busy slide, but I try to fit all the destinations into, into one slide. I will not go through all of them. Um, I will just mention that 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 the five areas uh, correspond to five different teams. So you have the InfraDev, which is about the development of research infrastructures. You have the InfraIOSC, which is about developing the, the IOSC system, the European Open Science Cloud, um, and making it operational. Um, then you have the InfraServe, which is R&D support to certain services, such as, for example, health research, green and digital transformation, and the advanced in frontier knowledge. Um, then you have the InfraTech, which is um, on next generation of scientific instrumentation. And here you'll find um, uh, calls on specifically targeting the instruments and tools and digital solutions towards achieving um, 
uh, a fully fledged research infrastructure. And then lastly, you have Infranet, which is about network con connectivity in research and education. So here is where, where they fuse um, education and research into one, and also empowering it by the digital transformation. Next slide. So another area which I cover is cluster, cluster one. Um, under pillar two. So now we have moved from pillar one to pillar two. Um, and the first cluster is health. Um, health has a combined budget of uh, 8.3 billion euros over the next seven years. And for 2021 and 2022, uh, there is a near marked budget of 1.75 billion euros. And it's split up into six destinations. What I want to mention about health and also there, there are um, a number of other uh, clusters which have the same the same kind of layout that under horizon horizon europe uh, one of the new features is that apart from having the, the traditional work program we also have the missions and partnerships which are um, areas which are directly connected to the cluster but in the same in, in some manner a bit a, a bit um, uh, separate to to, to 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 what we are we have been used to so far. So, so far we, we had just a work program on health. In Horizon Europe, we also have the work program on health, but we also have a work program for a mission and the mission for, for health is, is cancer and also uh, partnerships, which um, there are a number of partnerships which will be launched in 2021 and 2022 um, in health, um, but they would have separate work programs. Uh, Malta will be participating in, in transforming the health and care systems transformation. Um, MCST is committing a budget towards this partnership. Um, but obviously, obviously that, that, that has to be tackled separately. We would need a full day probably on health alone um, to cover all these three areas. Today, I will focus solely on the, on the, the work program um, under Horizon Europe uh, for health slide. Also, what I want to mention in addition to that is that uh, we've had a webinar specifically on health, one of our webinar Wednesdays. Um, our YouTube channel has the recording of that session. And there I had covered also the missions and the partnerships, so you can get some more idea. Um, also, I am available for any one-to-one -one meeting. Should any one of you have any, any, any questions for any of the NCP, so not just myself, um, we would be very happy to, to to meet with you, meet up with you one one to one, and be able to go into more information. So, in a nutshell, um, the work program on health is split into six destinations. Um, the first one is about staying healthy in a rapidly changing society, and here you will find calls on obesity, mental health, etc. Um, the second destination is about living and working in a health health promoting environment so here they're trying to promote health and also also having a clean environment and um, tackling diseases is the third um, um, destination um, the fourth destination is about ensuring access to innovative sustainable and high quality healthcare. care um, the fifth destination is about unlocking the full potential of new tools technologies and digital solutions for a healthy society and this exercise is about maintaining an innovative, sustainable, and globally competitive health, health, health industry. Um, in a nutshell, I can tell you that, that, that uh, this work program seeks to strike a balance between having, having a healthy society. So you have, you have a good mental health, especially now that, that we're coming out of this, this crisis. Uh, many people have been affected. So there is a lot of there are there are some calls, some significant calls and funding going to, towards mental health, about diet, having have, having an optimal diet, um, then one of uh, um, the main features is also um, a cleaner environment and having having an environment that that helps us to keep healthy. Obviously, tackling diseases is a mainstay. It remained, I mean, throughout Horizon 2020 as one of one of the mainstay call, calls because obviously diseases continue coming and they need to be tackled. Um, 
also the high quality healthcare and also the digitization of health. These are two topics which, which, which feature very strongly in this, this work program. And also maintaining the, competi the competitiveness of our health sector. So health is one of the areas of the European Union which um, is seen as, as, as needing uh, investment to continue to be at the forefront of, of, of its delivery. So, so in a nutshell, this is, a, this is, this is about health. Um, from my side, I have covered the three, the, three, um, the three areas that I cover. I now pass on uh, to Mark, my, to, uh, sorry, to Tamara, my colleague, uh, to present cluster two. Hi, thank you, Ian, for your intervention. So um, I'm Tamara, National Contact Point for Cluster 2, um, uh, Cluster 5 and Cluster 6. And today, we, for, for the time being, we will be speaking about Cluster 2. So Cluster 2 focuses on the culture and creative and inclusive society. Um, uh, the total budget over the seven years is 2.28 billion. And uh, for these two years, because um, the work programs, the goals, they are issued every two years. But the long term seven year vision, um, uh, Cluster 2 has 2.28 billion dedicated to it for these coming two years, um, uh, almost. So um, 422 million. There are a total of three destinations um, uh, under this cluster, and uh, these are on governance. So if I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So these are on, on governance, on the culture and creative industries, and on the social and economic transformations. So the, the cluster two is the, uh, the smallest cluster in terms of budget. Um, however, there is a lot of potential, and uh, we see another side of Horizon Europe to, to, with cluster two. So the various destination is, is innovative research on democracy and governance. And here, um, the research activities, they will assist in the modernization of democratic governance. So digital tools are encouraged to, um, uh, to have a, an important role here, as well as feminisms in, in, in governance. Other issues covered under destination one would be um, active citizenship um, uh, and the way as well kind of international relations too. So destination one is a very important destination for cluster two. Moving on to destination two, it's uh, on the innovative research on European culture, heritage and culture and creative industries. So here the activities, as you can see, I um, put an image of Tempus. Why? Because um, this destination, it focuses on heritage sites, cultural landscapes, museums, other cultural institutions, languages, games. So um, not only um, the, the cultural heritage aspect, but also the culture and creative industries. And there we see even movies, games, uh, music, so the arts. We are focusing on um, giving a boost to the arts again as well and to the, to the cultural heritage. COVID has made a huge impact on these on these industries and this destination it wants to target um, this issue, this, this um, negative impact of COVID on, on the cultural industries. We want to digitize them, we want to still respect the environment. Um, so destination two, it's, it's quite a very um, open, open destination and it covers all aspects of, of the arts. Moving on to destination three, so it's innovative research on social and economic transformations. So here we want to transform society for the better. Um, and how, so here are calls that target migration, for example, the uh, integrating migration, so mobility policies, um, both internal and external, as well as activities promoting and ensuring inclusion and the equity in education and training. So here, this destination focuses as well on adult education, um, it even targets aging societies, um, uh, and the inclusion not only of um, um, migrants, but as well as other subgroups of society. So um, we are here, we want to include everyone in society and we want that society as well, um, everyone is equipped into this digital and modern age. So in a nutshell, those are the three destinations. I pass on um, uh, the floor to my colleague Mark, who will be covering cluster three. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Melak, and I am the National Contact Point for the Digital Industry and Space and Civil Security for Society, and also EIP. 
So now we're going to discuss the security cluster, which basically is about protecting society from any threats which are coming from criminals, terrorists, or even cyber attacks. So in a nutshell, we can see that the budget for the whole seven years is 1.5 billion. And for the um, two year work program is 406 million euros. And you cover six destination areas. So next slide, please. So when it comes to um, research, we always need to keep in mind um, policy. And obviously the document the, is always contributing to some policy agendas. So in this case, for the civil security for society, we have the following um, agendas and strategies that need to be addressed in a way. So also when you are addressing a research topic, make sure that if, for example, you are uh, um, doing a, a research project on migration, make sure that you know that there's the new pact on migration and asylum. For example, if there's uh, something related to maritime security, that there is a strategy on maritime security. Oh, sorry, oh, so th thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, I had my my camera off. Um, so this is the these are sorry this, these are the destinations. So obviously each destination is actually grouping a set of of topics which obviously are related to a particular area. So we start off by um, the first destination, which is, which is about um, fighting crime and terrorism. One thing um, about the security research cluster is that it really involves stakeholders. So in this case, um, in the first destination, you will see a lot of involvement of law enforcement agencies. For example, there's the cyber, cyber crime, sexual abuse, um, identity theft. So here you will find a lot of topics that are um, actually combating these type of um, risks. There are about um, 13 projects to be funded and the total budget for the work program of the um, this year is about 56 million. Then we move on to the next destination, which is about um, external border protection. Obviously, due to uh, migration and also even um, illicit trafficking of, of goods, um, there is a lot of research being done, for example, finding uh, hidden um, items, even at customs level. So here, the, the involvement of stakeholders, which are related to border patrolling and also customs offices, can be in a way uh, addressed in this destination. Then we have the resilient infrastructure. So actually, what is infrastructure? It's everything that is creating a society as it is, meaning like the electricity grid, the water systems, um, the financial systems. Obviously, this, these um, structures need to be resilient against any form of threats, even from terrorists. So obviously, the, the, pro the, the research projects here need to address the resilience and the autonomy of our uh, infrastructures. Next slide, please. Increase cybersecurity. Nowadays, cybersecurity has become very high on the European agenda. And here uh, we find all the topics that are addressing cybersecurity. Previously, it was shared between the digital cluster and the security one, but now all the cybersecurity topics are found in this destination under the civil security for society. Then we have the Disaster Resilient Society for Europe topics, which actually is about um, preparing society against any man-made or even natural disasters. Here you find a very heavy involvement of civil protection here. So the, call, um, the type of calls and topics obviously require the involvement of this kind of um, task force. And finally, the last destination is strengthening security, research and innovation is about supporting the activities that are mentioned in the previous um, destinations. And also there is an element of um, NCP support in this topic as well. I can move to the next slide, please. So um, these are the opening dates. So the calls are already open and consortia are already being formed. So make sure that if you are going to apply or for the cause of this deadline, this year's deadline or, or next year, make sure that you get involved with us. We can support you in finding um, partners and even uh, forming consortia. And these type of calls are very practical. So um, the involvement of people on the ground needs to be also considered, but uh, the deadline is already in a way uh, not too much distant. So if you want to prepare um, a proposal, you need to start um, to work um, from this week in a way. So obviously get in touch with us so that we can support you in finding the best call um, so that you can apply to. So next slide, please. 
So now I move to the digital cluster, um, industry and space cluster, sorry. So this, uh, on the contrary, uh, previously in the horizon 2020, the clusters were separate, but now this time around, uh, these are joined into one black cluster. Even if you can notice the budget is of 15 billion for um, the whole seven years and 3 billion for these only two years. So here, um, the, the, this, this work program is quite extensive. It's covering all the digital technologies, industry, and also space. Obviously here, the European Union is trying to elevate the industrial competitiveness of its industry and also uh, advancing digitalization in order also to contribute to the Green Deal objectives. So the next slide, please. So yet again, um, just to give you a little bit of summary here in this uh, work program, you will find anything related to manufacturing technologies, advanced materials, artificial intelligence and robotics, um, edge computing, uh, next generation internet, circularity of industry and renewables, um, and also space, and also earth observation, and also supporting um, services that are coming from space systems. Next slide, please. Um, the, the structure is nearly the same, so we have six destinations. Each destination is covering a particular um, set of topics. So in the first one, we are focusing mostly on cr creating an industry which is not taxing on climate. So we have this um, climate neutrality in our uh, industry. So there is also the introduction of industrial symbiosis, meaning using the waste of an industry to be um, as a raw material for another. And there's also the uh, push to have a more uh, electrified processes in order to, uh, um, to create um, a cleaner way of producing items and energy. In destination two, we are focusing really mostly on raw materials and their provenance and even their value chains. So we, we need to make sure that even the extraction of these raw materials are in a way um, not contributing badly to our um, climate and environment. Then we start off um, going into the digital um, realm now and under world leading data and computing technologies. Here we find anything related to big data, IoT, cloud computing, and so on. Next slide, please. And then we have the fourth destination, which is actually um, any digital um, research on digital technologies to, to contribute to the Green Deal. So here we even are considering uh, the energy consumption of processors. So you can understand the, the drive to actually um, align any process so that it will be um, compliant with the uh, Green Deal objectives. Here we have also um, already uh, the look into 6G, photonics, and also quantum. Quantum is, a, is one of the uh, competitive and strategic uh, technologies that European Union is really investing on because obviously the, 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 the continent that has quantum technology at hand will obviously have strategic autonomy over others. Then we have uh, the, in the fifth des destination, we find all the space topics there. So if you are interested in, in space and its services like Galileo, Agnos, and Copernicus, Gosatom. So obviously there will be um, a lot of topics that also support and their digital evolution. So obviously, as you might be aware, we are receiving a lot of information from, from space and usually the type of topics there um, have an element of digitalization in order to extract um, data and make it interoperable uh, for any other application. And finally, we conclude uh, with the human centricity um, and ethical development of digital technologies such as AI and robotics. So here we have also a look into XR, um, XR and uh, extended reality, meaning AR, VR, VR MR. So this, um, this kind of destination is very focused on these kind of technologies. Next slide, please. So here, since obviously the complexity um, of the of the documents is quite various, and obviously the, the calls are have different um, deadlines. Yet again, there are some deadlines for this year and some deadlines for next year. So yet again, if you are interested in a particular area, because obviously with the time permitting, we cannot go into the detail of the actual topics, um, I can look to come, ask you to come forward so that we can have a one-to-one -one meeting so that we can discover any topics of your interest. Next slide.
Okay, so that, that was um, from my end. Thank you very much. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? I assume so. Um, my name is George Bajay, one of the national contact points, and I'm working on cluster five together with my colleague Tamara, who was presented earlier. And if you have any questions on cluster five, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll guide you accordingly. So cluster five is about um, decarbonizing the economy, uh, specifically the energy and mobility sectors. Um, of course, with uh, climate neutrality as the objective for a carbon neutral Europe by 2050. Of course, there are short term um, milestones that we wish to reach by 2030. And this is what is trying to be addressed through um, the first work program. So um, the work program covers um, the three areas, of course, climate, energy and mobility. Um, I believe it's one of the largest um, in terms of funding um, cluster with 15.1 uh, billion allocated to it for the next seven years. And the first uh, work program um, contains up to 2.8 billion euros of funding. Um, there are six areas um, of destination areas that um, implement these um, uh, budget lines. So um, before we move on to the next slide, um, you can leave it there, don't worry. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, the work program, of course, addresses the European Green Deal. And of course, this is all aligned with the uh, twin green and digital transition and all aspects are um, addressed within the work program and associated missions and partnerships on this slide um, i try to um, put everything in into one um, slide here so it becomes a bit easier to um, uh, absorb all the information um, we have uh, over 185 topics for 2021-2022. Um, we expect a total of 450 projects to be funded by the European Commission um, across the three areas, climate, energy and mobility. The first thing I've put down on the slides here are the deadlines. As you can see, the um, closest deadlines are as close as 14 September 2021. And for climate and mobility, the next cutoffs of the topics would be the 19th of October. Um, for the energy, they're a bit more staggered and they start um, on the 19th of October, the deadline. And the following one is the uh, 5th of January of next year, 2022. Um, of course, there are other forthcoming topics. Um, that you want to have a look at. These are available on the funding and tendering portal. And I do suggest that um, you have a look at these because there are so many opportunities that you can try to tap. So going to, um, uh, to the destinations now, as I mentioned on the previous slides, there are six destinations. Uh, the first two uh, are related to climate. These cover climate sciences and response, uh, batteries, emerging breakthrough technologies, and citizen and stakeholder engagement. And um, they were also planned to cover uh, communities and cities. However, this seems to be transitioning to a different work program specifically for the missions. And we expect this to be um, further elaborated by the European Commission towards September of this year. Once we have more insights, we'll share them with you, of course. Uh, moving on to destination three and four, these cover energy, specifically renewables, energy systems and grids, carbon capture, utilization and storage, energy efficient buildings and industrial decarbonization. Uh, moving on to mobility, it's covered by destination five and six, where we have zero emission uh, road transport, aviation, waterborne transport, impact of transport on the environment and human health, uh, connected cooperative and automated mobility, or CCA, CCIM abbreviated as so. And uh, finally, we have safety and resilience and mobility, sorry, multimodal and sustainable transport systems. Um, 
there's a lot to be said about um, each destination. In fact, the commission is um, at the moment um, holding the info days for uh, cluster five, which is today and tomorrow. Unfortunately, it's coinciding with this event, but um, the info days are recorded, so you can follow these at your leisure um, following the info days. Um, and also, I want to mention that um, this Wednesday, the 7th, um, there is also the brokerage opportunities that you can utilize to network with um, people who are interested in, in Cluster 5. I've put here links to the policy and strategy documents. These are all live links. So once you have the presentation, you can quickly um, access them. Um, there's also the, the links to the open calls and the forthcoming ones. And there are also links um, for the work program. Can you click one more time, please? Um, here, um, I've included the um, information uh, to access the info days. So it's only one click away, um, apart from being available on the um, European portal. It's also available on YouTube, so you can access these at any time of the day. And they are providing a lot of information on cluster five, um, covering everything from intervention logic, the strategic plan, and the overview of cluster five um, overall. One more click, please. Um, what I do suggest is if you um, are interested in participating, um, it's quite important to be aware of the Horizon Europe strategic plan, because this is all aligned with cluster five and the missions and the work pro um, sorry, the missions and the European partnerships. One last thing I want to mention about the missions and partnerships is uh, across cluster five, these are very much linked. Um, I think there are three mission areas that are linked with cluster five. Um, so please make sure to have a look at these once the information becomes available. And um, the last word I'll say about this is on the partnerships. There's partnerships on batteries. Um, there's one uh, targeting um, energy efficient buildings, which is called Built for People, and also one on hydrogen. Um, there's uh, a few others related to mobility and energy as well. So if you're interested, unfortunately, we do not have the time to cover all of these, but please reach out and we can provide you with more insights. I give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, as uh, as you well said, I as well as is George in, in cluster five. So um, if you have any, any questions or you would like to organize a one-to-one -one meeting, we would be more than happy to assist you. So moving on to cluster six, which ties in very well with cluster five, um, is the food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture, and environment cluster. So um, there are quite a wide variety of areas under this cluster um, with a total budget of almost 9 billion over the period of seven years. But for these upcoming two years, there's a total budget of approximately 2 billion as well. And there are a total of seven areas. So there are a total of seven destinations. Under cluster six, um, uh, there is also a, a specific principle that is constantly mentioned. So you should really take into account the do no significant harm principle. This is also very relevant under cluster five and to some extent under cluster four as well. So the do no significant harm principle um, uh, is basically, um, it's found under the EU taxonomy regulation and it wants to address um, specific six environmental objectives. So, as the title suggests, you cannot do harm to these six environmental objectives, which are climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation, um, transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, protection and restoration of biodiversity, and the sustainable use and protection of, of water and marine resources. Um, uh, as well, you have to also consider this do no significant harm principle at the back of your head with every um, topic you encounter under this specific cluster. As well, cluster six has quite a number of policies ties to it that you should always take into consideration, such as the Green Deal. There is a specific destination as well um, on the Green Deal under cluster six. Um, the EU Biodiversity Strategy for 2030, it's a very important strategy, especially under destination one, which we will um, 
speak about very soon. Um, and as well, obviously, uh, the climate neutrality um, target by 2050. So these, uh, these important um, uh, strategies, documents, and policies, you always have to keep them in the back of your mind when applying for, for a call on the plus 36. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So as I said, cluster six has a total of seven destinations. Um, the first one is specifically on biodiversity and ecosystem services. So we want to preserve, protect biodiversity, and um, we want to build resilient ecosystems by 2030, and we want to respect the biodiversity strategy. So here, um, uh, there are quite a number of topics that uh, they want to enhance on services, ecosystem services, um, especially on land, in land, water, and at sea, to improve knowledge and innovation. Moving on to um, the second destination. So the second destination is on fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly food systems, from primary production to consumption. So as the image suggests, um, this is focusing on farming, so on, on different types of farming, sustainable farming, sustainable fisheries, aqua culture, transforming food systems for health, um, even studying certain um, species as well, for example, bees, um, this is as well a specific topic focusing on bees and their importance, and they are the most important um, um, species that, that we have, especially when it comes to the, the food system sector. Um, uh, there is another destination, destination two is on circular economy and bioeconomy service sectors. And basically, we want to um, uh, preserve as well climate neutrality. We want to improve the, the circular economy, have bioeconomy transitions, um, as well as sustainable forestry. So destination three ties well into destination two as well. Moving on to clean environment and zero pollution. So we are working towards zero pollution. This is as well stressed into the Green Deal. Um, and we want to focus on zero pollution and a clean, a clean environment on all um, areas. So we are focusing on fresh and marine water systems, soil, air, and uh, it, this destination really focuses on nitrogen and phosphorus emissions as well. Um, moving on to the next slide, please. So the fifth destination is on the land, ocean, and water for climate action. Notice under cluster six, um, it always takes into consideration um, all aspects. So not simply focusing on, on, for example, air pollution or mitigating uh, pollution through through marine, etc. So we are focusing on all 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 of the sectors. So land, ocean, and water. Um, uh, and obviously this is needed and this is very stressed under this cluster because obviously mitigation needs to, needs to be adapted on, on all sectors. Resilient, inclusive, healthy and green rural coast and urban communities. Here um, we are focusing more as well on the citizens too. So the, the social, economic and democratic changes required. Um, uh, we want equal opportunities for people. And as well, we are focusing on policy responses here um, and the governance. So plus um, destination six is focusing more as well on citizen engagement and how we can become, we can transition to to a better society and um, do the necessary changes to have um, healthy and green rural and care coast and urban communities. The last uh, destination is on innovative governance, so it ties in well with destination six. However, um, we want digital solution in support of the Green Deal. So while destination six is focusing on the communities and governance, destination seven is focusing on the community and governance, but in relation to the Green Deal. We want a, a continuation of the Green Deal. So it didn't just stop with Horizon 2020. We want to keep it going even in Horizon Europe. So um, here we find quite a number of opportunities as well um, uh, that are translated from the Green Deal into Cluster 6. Um, so the Green Deal had several areas. For example, they had the farm to fork um, area, which is very addressed on their um, destination, destination two, the one on, on farming, etc. So, and here the governance related to the Green Deal is focused on their destination seven. So, um, we highly encourage people who have um, applied for the Green Deal um, and maybe weren't successful. You have a look at cluster six because um, the Green Deal is really, really highly present under cluster six. 
we are focusing here on the innovative governance, environmental observation, and digital solutions. So we want to experiment with new ways to govern the transition process and modernize the governments in particular by making information and knowledge available and accessible. So we want the we want the research and the innovation, the outputs to help with policy implementation and as well um, to create kind of a, a sustainable path for our future. So um, those are all the destinations. If you want more information, obviously, um, we can set a one-to-one -one meeting or you can have a look on our YouTube channel. There's a whole an hour dedicated for cluster six. Um, and as well, it's important to mention that the, uh, the, um, the clusters tie in well with the EU missions, especially um, uh, cluster six ties in very well with the climate mission too. Um, and even cluster five ties in well with the climate mission and the cities mission and this is the soil mission. So um, uh, we can move on to the next slide, please. So the funding and tenders portal demo, I'm going to start sharing my screen so we can have a look on how we can access all these opportunities. We have spoken about a lot of opportunities, but now we want to learn how we can actually um, look into it. So I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, can someone confirm that they can see my screen? Good. Okay, so um, what I did here is I simply wrote funding and tenders portal on Google. And the first option is going to be the ec.europa.eu website. So you simply click on it. And you're going, so the funding and tenders portal has all of the EU funding programs um, summed up in it. So we want the Horizon Europe part and we simply select Horizon Europe. We're going to be found into this page um, and here are the pillars. So the pillars that, that Ante has spoken about, they're here. So there's pillar one, pillar two, pillar three, as well those cross-cutting areas. And here, um, basically here is where, where that presentation, you can really see how, how it works as well in real life. So everything is found on the funding and tender portal. What I normally suggest is that if you have a specific area, for example, you focus on AI, you simply type a keyword AI and you will see all of the AI opportunities under Horizon um, Europe. So it's just loading. And you simply click here. So there are a total of 833 opportunities open right now. And you definitely need to um, filter out, obviously. Um, that's quite an extensive list. So hopefully it loads up AI. Maybe I'll try refreshing. I'll try to do, there seems to be a bug, so I'll try to use another keyword. Okay. All right, so um, there seems, seems to be a, maybe a, a small issue with the Wi-Fi, but um, here we are. So the keyword that I chose is culture. As I spoke previously, there is a whole um, uh, cluster on culture. Um, uh, and you will, with this keyword now, there are 18 opportunities. So it's better than looking through all those 833 ones. You select the closed, so only the open and forthcoming opportunities would come up. And here we're still at 18. So um, uh, you have a lot of opportunities here. So for example, um, if you were interested in um, uh, applying for a specific topic, for example, the coordination of European cultural heritage and innovation among member states, you simply click on it and it will direct you to the call text where you can actually apply there. So when you apply for a call, it's always through the funding and tenders portal. And normally, um, the coordinator submits the proposal. So we will get back as well um, to, some, to, to the different types of roles you can have in a, in a project. But um, 
once you click on on the call you will end up into this web page so you will see the details as we said there are different types of actions for example this is a csa a coordination and support action it's a single stage what does it mean it means that there's only one submission so one opening date and one closing date and if it was at two stage there would be two deadlines so we would apply for the first deadline if you get selected you apply for the second deadline this case um it's a single stage and the majority they, they are single stage so um the opening date uh, it opened a few days ago so 22nd of june the deadline is on the 7th of october 2021 so uh, you can you can obviously apply now you can see the budget overview as well and uh, you have the topic text here so your project has to target this specific paragraph, this specific paragraph. So by the end of the project, you have to develop an open approach to cultural heritage and the arts, etc. So obviously the text will always suggest um, what you will do. That's how the, the clusters work. So the clusters work by the EU providing you, let's say, with a challenge, with a topic, and then you have to address it with your innovative idea. You scroll down as well, and uh, there's the admissibility conditions. There's some information on the destination in general. Um, remember that for cluster two, there are only three destinations. And then you can even see the organization that are looking for partners under this topic. So you can even view other people that are looking for um, partners here. And you can actually contact them. Obviously, you have to be logged into your EU account and you have to have an account, so we need to register. It's a very um, easy registration, um, normal registration procedure. Um, and then you will be given an, a nine-digit a nine digit code, which we call the PIC. So this code will be used so other organizations as well can identify you. And basically, through the portal, you can actually find partners where you can team up and apply for a project. So the portal helps you in, its, in, in itself. So that is how you go about in applying. Um, uh, you simply find a call and then you can even start the submission. So you would click and you would click start submission if you actually want to apply for the call. Everything is always done online. Apart from actually applying for the call, the funding and tenders portal has a lot of tools where it can support you. So I'm just going to switch the tab a bit because I am logged into my account um, uh, and the other tab so it would be a bit easier to to kind of explain so there are a lot of um, tabs here let's go to the home page so you can obviously search the funding contenders we already went through that you can see some funding updates and some archive funding how to participate so this step is very important if you have some quick questions you can even find some fake use so some key steps for example um how do you participate obviously we are here to help you but maybe if you want a really quick answer you can always go on the funding and enter support and kind of see how you can go about it so as we suggest you first you find a suitable call you find project partners if, if the call tells you that you need at least three partners which most of them are like that and um, for the clusters create a new login account um register your organization and then you will have that nine digit code and then you submit your proposal if you're the coordinator so um the portal really helps you um in understanding how to apply for a call um you can even see the participant register so let's say i'm an individual i'm working um in a company um i've been recently recruited i'm not sure if somebody else has registered that is no problem at all. You simply search if your organization is already registered. So this is where you can find if a specific organization is already registered. For example, let's write Universita. Um, we select a country, Malta. We search the organization. And there we find Universita Tamalta. And we always look at the validated one. So um, as you can see, this one is declared, it's not applicable. But you always look at the validated one. Do not, um, uh, do not contact organizations sometimes which are declared, or maybe you see three re or registered organization, always look for the validated one. Sometimes if it's a new registered organization, they might still be in the process of getting validated. What's the difference between declared and validated? 
So declared, you simply register. So it's declared. It validated when you provide some additional supporting documents um, to kind of verify that you really are the, the, that type of organization as well. So um, as you can see, there's as well information. So you can see the quick number of the university, that um, Erasmus code as well in some certain cases, registration number, and you can as well contact them. So if you, know, you are aware of a specific organization, you can always um, search it on the funding and then there is support. Moving on to projects and results, you can as well um, filter. So this section here, you can find some as well previously funded initiatives and you can as well work as an expert. So um, if you want to be an evaluator, um, yourself as an individual, you can, yes, you can register as an expert simply by clicking on the register as an expert button. And it will take you um, uh, to another page where you actually um, express your interest in what type of expert you are, what type of proposals you want to evaluate, etc. So um, hopefully it, it loads up. Okay, so my expert area. And then you can register, you, you tell them who you are um, and register as an expert. And then the commission can select you. So you would be up for selection. And um, if this commission selects you, you will be directly contacted by them. And then you would start your journey as an evaluator as well. It's a good uh, initiative and opportunity for you to, to work as an expert because you can just see how real proposal works or how a real proposal works. And you can see the difference between a good proposal and the bad proposal as well. Moving on, so there are some other guidance and manuals, FAQs, um, help this can support services. The FAQs are very useful. So if you have a specific question, um, it might be already answered under the FAQs. So that is all for the funding and tenders portal. Here, the main things, the main takeaways under the funding and tenders portal are that you can find partners you can apply directly on the funding and tenders portal. If you have any quick questions, you can probably find the answer there. And fourth, um, uh, you can register as an expert. So you can register to be an evaluator yourself. So that is the funding and tenders portal in a nutshell. Um, maybe we could move on to the presentation again, please. Thank you. So if you have any questions, um, uh, it would be a, a good time to address them now during the first half of the session. Um, uh, I don't see that there's anyone in the chat, but maybe we can leave a minute or two um, for people to, to pose their questions. As well, if you have any um, questions, you can obviously unmute um, and we can address them now as well. Put them in the chat or unmute yourselves. It seems that there are no questions. Uh, maybe we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, now we are going to speak about finding partners. So what do you look for in a partner? Obviously, you have to complement each other, um, have to balance each other and be excellent. So they have to um, be relevant to your project. There are two major roles. So you either are a coordinator or a beneficiary. The difference is a coordinator, um, let's say he, he's the boss of the project, um, and he will um, as well kind of join the consortium and he will write a proposal and apply. So the coordinator will really make use of the funding and tenders portal because he has actually to submit the proposal there. 
then a beneficiary, you would be contributing to the project. So you wouldn't be involved per se in the writing up of the proposal, but yes, you might be asked to maybe write a page um, about your role in, in the project, but that would be probably about it. Um, and then you would be assigned the tasks that you would like to do, and uh, you are probably for the budget needed for those tasks. And basically the beneficiary role is um, uh, a bit, it's less intense than the coordinator one. However, we always suggest that if you are a complete beginner, um, it's good that you start as a beneficiary and then you move on to the next step as a coordinator. If you still want to be a coordinator, if you have experience, or even if you don't have experience, we will always assist you. There's a specific scheme um, uh, at MCSD. It's called the IPAS plus um, the uh, part B, we uh, offer um, around 5,000 euro for Maltese um, entities. There's some sort of... For Maltese entities um, that would like to coordinate. And you will be given 5,000 euro. Um, uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? The IPAS plus deadline, it... Uh, it has, um, we're going to issue another one soon. Um, uh, the first deadline has just passed, but um, uh, it's kind of recurring in that sense. So there's always, um, we always try to help our coordinators in the best way we can, even by sometimes offering um, like a small grant. So you can hire an external evaluator with this 5,000 euro, so they could help you in the writing up of your proposal. So next slide, please. The partner search form, so we as NCPs, um, we have this partner search form system where we have a template, so we already have this template. And under this template, you list in your details. So normally what happens is that um, we have interested applicants that they would like to partner up. And we give them this, um, um, this template where they fill it up with their organization profile, contact details, past experiences, the specific topics that they're interested in, their role in the project, either if they want to be a coordinator or a beneficiary, and why they should be chosen to be part of the consortium. That's very important that you um, specify what you're going to bring to the table. So what makes you an attractive partner to join in this consortium that would apply for Horizon. We circulate this with our networks and uh, obviously we help you in this matchmaking process. We as NCPs, we are part of different networks, for, for example, I am part of a network um, of different networks of cluster 2, 5 and 6, and we all share um, these partner searches and attempts to create a connection for our, um, for our applicants. So next slide, please. So this slide is a recap on how you can find partners. So we always suggest you start from your personal networks. So if you already have um, uh, existing networks that have maybe you applied with them for another fund or anything else, yes, we suggest that you use your personal networks. You're more experienced, you're familiar, you know how they work. And um, so that's always a good start that you, you start from your own personal networks. You ask us um, so we can search, um, so we can disseminate your partner search form with other NCPs abroad internationally, and we can help you find partners there. Obviously, um, another important point is that you attend the commission's events. There are a lot of events taking place online. George mentioned well the, the info session and brokerage events. Um, there is an info session and brokerage event for every cluster. Um, uh, so in the this week, cluster five and cluster six, I can confirm that there is there are going to be the brokerage events. Um, if you simply simply Google um, cluster five brokerage event, it will I am it will come up on uh, on your browser and you can register there. Um, uh, as well, check previously funded projects on the core this for this portal. So um, another good way to find partners is by kind of finding a similar initiative or not a similar initiative, but let's say you work um, for, you work under the cultural industries and you type on for this culture. So you see what kind of other cultural projects have already been funded. 
one it would um, you would avoid to kind of duplicate the research so um, you would as well see what has been previously funded maybe you can build on that as well and you could see who the, the main key players are who the, are the coordinators that have have, have a good track record of, of um, um, getting funded under Horizon Europe and you can contact them. What we suggest is that you do not contact someone who has been recently funded. Obviously they would be busy with that project, but maybe someone who is almost terminating their project and is probably looking for another opportunity to get funded under Horizon. So that's a very good way to find partners. Um, um, as we saw on the Funding and Tenders portal, there were 10 organizations looking at that call. You as well can express your interest on directly on the funding and tenders portal, and then people can contact you through that. And as well, the project repository journal, when you can see other some um, dissemination material and other projects funded, and as well um, use the tool for R and I stakeholders in the Mediterranean region, country. So it's a tool that um, is used by uh, Mediterranean countries to find partners as well. Um, next slide, please. So now I give the, the floor to my colleague, George, where he's going to speak about proposal writing and the different roles and the inputs that would be required. Thank you. Hello again, it's George. So in uh, this section, um, I'll explain to you a bit uh, some concepts about proposal writing. So let's say you've already went through the funding and tendering portal and you identified um, a specific call topic that you want to participate in. So the next step is to understand your role in the project and determine exactly um, the level of input that you need to prepare for with regards to your participation. So of course you've identified the call topic and you have this brilliant idea that you want to develop into a project so of course you since this is a cooperative uh, type of program um, you need to bring in your partners that you want to collaborate with so specifically the consortium so i've put a picture here just to give you an idea that you need to bring in people not just partners being institutions you're going to work with people and you need to understand the involvement of everyone in the project so we have the idea we want to carry out research and of course we're doing this to achieve a specific goal and that goal is basically the research outputs from the project Hello, I believe I got muted for a moment, so I'll, I'll recap on the slide. So here in the slide, we're talking about the different roles in the, um, in the uh, consortium. As I was saying, there's uh, the first decision you have to make is if you're going to coordinate uh, the proposal or if you want to have specific actions within the proposal. So as a coordinator, you're doing a lot of project management and administration of the project. While as a work package leader or as a task leader, you are doing specific actions that contribute to uh, the outputs of the project. So you work specifically on those. So the difference um, here is that either you're a coordinator or you're a beneficiary. Coordinator is, of course, still a beneficiary, but he is the main uh, interlector with, with the European Commission. Here, the um, important notion of roles is you have to differentiate between the actual roles in the project and the roles that we describe within um, the participant portal. So 
one type of role in the participant portal is the layer. That is different from when we talk about um, the level of contribution within the work, uh, work uh, proposal or, and the work that you're going to contribute. So make sure to understand that there are different roles and roles within um, each entity. So moving on to the next slide, um, we're going to focus on, on each type of uh, participation in, in the proposal. So the first one is, of course, the coordinator role. So as I mentioned previously, the coordinator is the main interlocutor with the, with the commission. What this means is basically that the assigned project officer of the funded project is going to communicate um, mainly with the uh, coordinator of the project. And if there are um, clarifications to be made, these are made with the coordinator. So the coordinator, of course, coordinates the project implementation, maintains the deliverables and the tasks, associated reporting, and allocates the budgets accordingly. So it involves a lot of administration. At proposal stage, the coordinator uh, forms the consortium and assigns tasks that are matched with the partners. So uh, he ensures that the all the uh, beneficiaries that are joining the consortium have specific roles and contribute to the final outcomes. And of course, the coordinator writes and submits the proposal and ensures that the budget uh, is in line with the activities that are being uh, proposed. And a final note, as Tamara mentioned, for coordinators, we have a specific scheme that um, any multi beneficiary can participate uh, in it, which is the IPS Plus scheme, where we um, give you funds to um, secure the services of um, a third party to help you submit um, your proposal. Moving on to the next slide. So um, the work package leader is very a very important role in a project. Basically, the coordinator is assigning you um, and mandating you to deliver not just specific tasks, but the whole work package. So what that means at proposal stage is that you're drafting the specific deliverables within the uh, work packages with your partners and ensuring that these deliverables uh, make sense. So um, they, they are binding the deliverables. So it's quite important as work package leader to make sure that these deliverables make sense and you have the um, resources allocated accordingly. And when we say resources, it's both personnel and budgets to implement the, uh, the tasks. So at proposal stage, you always check that your, um, your plans are as close to as reality as possible. Um, of course, when you're implementing the uh, work package, there are, of course, some deviations, but you try to um, keep to the planned activities because, as I said, the um, deliverables are binding. So as a work package leader as at proposal stage, you calculate uh, the, uh, the budget that you need and you'd pass this information to the coordinator um, as part of the full submission. Um, it's quite important that uh, when you're doing the, um, the preparation of the wording of the work, uh, work package is to ensure that it's, it is consistent with the rest of the uh, proposal. So although there are different um, uh, writers in the uh, project, make sure that um, finally someone um, reviews this and aligns the wording and formatting in, in one context. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here we have um, the template for the CSA uh, template. So please ensure that if you're working on a different type of action that you have um, the relevant template. Here we're showing the template for uh, our package. So of course you have the work package number, you have the um, work package leader or lead beneficiary um, name. You of course enter the title of the work package. Um, the uh, 
partners working on the specific work package, um, the number of person months that are going to be needed when the work package is planned to start and when you uh, foresee that that work package will be completed. You have the work packages, the description of the work, and finally the deliverables. All this has to tie in together very well, and it should be written in a way that the evaluators can um, understand it um, without um, having issues to connect to other work packages or not having clarity um, where the deliverable is linked with the description of work. So it's quite important to have consistency throughout. Next slide, please. Um, so as task leader, um, this role basically falls within a work package. So you would be reporting to the work package leader as task leader, and you also, of course, um, report to the uh, coordinator of the project. So at proposal stage, your contribution is very limited. You're going to draft maybe for that task two or three paragraphs. Um, but you are clearly saying what will be done in that specific task and how you plan to achieve it together with your partners. So you have to ensure that you allocate the necessary resources and that you have the team that uh, is capable of implementing um, that, uh, that specific task. Um, this is the, um, this role is where the actual, you can say, research takes place. So you, are um, as task leader implementing the actual activities that um, uh, produce results at the end of the project. Next slide, please. Um, this is my last slide, I believe. Um, as a beneficiary, basically what this means is you are um, receiving funds, you are signing the grant agreement, and of course you will have um, a consortium agreement in place with the other beneficiaries. Um, what you need to provide at proposal stage as a beneficiary is a profile of your organization um, and the team involved within that organization and of course the resources, so uh, the budget that you will need for all the roles that you foresee in, in, in the different work packages. Um, as a beneficiary, um, you're obligated uh, by the grant agreement so make sure that um, your legal team in your entity is well aware of the um, obligations. And of course, if you um, are not sure or need clarification on specific tasks and activities or obligations, feel free to reach out to us so we can guide you accordingly. Thank you for listening. I pass the floor back to my colleagues. So thank you, George. So. So now we move to the um, actual submission. So basically, in order to submit a project, there is a, um, a proposal that needs to be filled up. And the proposal is split into two main areas. So you have the part A, which is actually the administrative part, uh, which is actually um, containing information about the consortium and the partners and so on. And obviously part B is, is the technical uh, information about how you're gonna do the actual um, research to, 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 to address the challenge. Next slide, please. So obviously for part, part A, and this is obviously all online. So once you, um, as, as rightly mentioned by Tamara, that when you find the call, there is the start submission. So when you do that and start submission, you will start filling up information, the forms, which are actually the general information, the information about the the part, part partners and the budgets. And there are some checks that need to be done like the ethics and security self-assessment and any other questions. These are all done um, on the forms online. And next slide, please. And then once you do that, um, obviously the, the system also um, informs you that you have done um, the process correctly because also there are some markers. If, for example, you have a, a text box which is uh, highlighted red, it means that information is not complete or there's some something some difficulties there so once you do the whole process of the uh, application of part a you will now be asked to submit the actual proposal the proposal is a template that is downloaded uh, from the actual 
um, ported itself and then re-upload it again in the same port. So the, in a nutshell, the, the proposal is split into three areas. So the first part is focusing on the excellence. So here you need to make sure that you are um, and proposing an idea which is excellent in, in, in its sense. So you, the, the actual um, technology and even research components of it are, are breakthrough, avant-garde and also state of the art. Also, the, 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 the third, second part is the impact. So make sure that you are leaving an impact on society um, after um, addressing the challenge and also um, even the impact within the, the type of research researcher, let's say it's a health project, obviously there needs to be, um, let's say, uh, a change in policy or a, a new type of product, uh, which obviously will better off society. And finally, there is also the quality and implementation of, of, the, actual, of the actual research project. Basically here, it's all about um, how the consortium will run, the type of work packages, uh, and more, more and moreover, um, what is the complementarity of the actual work group, of the actual consortium? Meaning that all the members of the consortium need to have uh, a, a predefined um, task, which is actually mapping their capabilities and and expertise. So obviously, these are things that are looked into. So make sure, let's say, if you are going to consider a security call, and there's a a text which is impl impl implying that there needs to be um, the involvement of law enforcement agency. This is something that is checked um, at that stage in the quality and efficiency of implementation. If in your project there is no mention that you are going to include or there's no partners that are actually law enforcement agency, obviously um, your, your application will not be favorably considered. Next slide, please. Next. So obviously these are um, some more information on what um, the excellence is all about. So obviously there you need to identify um, your objective that these are in line with what is um, the challenging, the challenge is being asked for in the actual call. So make sure that you are addressing actually um, what is written there. The one, one, one good thing is to reread more than once the, to the topic. Make sure that also um, you identify the policy um, aspects of it. Usually there are the actual references of the top of the policy papers and strategies and CRS and so on in the document. So make sure that even, for example, you're going to present um, your, your, your pathway on how, to, on how to actually address the challenge. Make sure that you also make a link to policy because that is always very, very sought for. Obviously, the impact is all about um, creating a suitable solution, which is actually um, has a lot of quality in it and make sure that you have dissemination and exploitation plans as well of, of the innovation that is being created. So obviously we need to make sure that um, the impact is even disseminated within different communities, not only on, on, the, on, on the personnel that is working on the project, it used to be there will be an outward um, dissemination. And yet again, the quality and efficiency of implementation is all about um, how you're going to structure your project to be run efficiently and actually um, come up with the actual final positive uh, solution. It's, it's the, the, the last part, the, it's, it's more of like program um, pro project management in a way. So it's, it's very well um, appreciated if you are even conversed in that type of um, um, outcomes, let's say that. Next slide, please. So obviously once uh, the process is like this, so once you submit um, your proposal, um, your proposal is then when, when the cutoff date of the deadline has been surpassed, there will be an independent evaluation by external experts. Each individual um, expert will look into your proposal and score it independently. Usually the, the boards of experts is between three to five. Um, and then once they score it, um, differently, maybe, um, then they will meet together in order to make a consensus meeting where they discuss uh, the scoring. Once there is the consensus meeting, they come up with the actual uh, final list of results and also confirm if this project will be shortlisted uh, for funding or not. 
So in a way, uh, the process is uh, transparent and it's even monitored by the commission and also by external experts. Usually um, and the commission also invites external um, experts to review the process. And usually we program committee members uh, are even informed how the process actually went. So this is a very transparent and open process in a way. Finally, when, when the actual um, results are out, um, each um, coordinator will also receive an ESR, uh, which is an evaluation summary report, where there you will have um, the information related to your proposal. In that case, um, you will also know, um, so have some note on the type of scoring that you got, what were your weak points, what were your strong points, and so on. Next slide, please. One new thing um, that um, is, has been introduced in Horizon Europe, um, as you can see here, that the process previously was re, uh, very linear and that you have the individual evaluation of each expert, then you have the consensus group, panel review and finalization. Now, in this case, there is the um, introduction of the rebuttal, where basically uh, um, when the actual uh, individual, individual evaluation is done, the, the evaluator can actually ask the, the coordinator to have some clearance on certain aspects of the proposal. Maybe there was something that was not that clear, and then the actual proposer can redress that, that, that particular um, highlighted element in, in the proposal. Obviously, something like this is uh, at benefit to the actual applicants because obviously um, there's a, a better ch chance to convey um, a better message within the actual proposal. Next slide. So when it comes to um, the actual process, the timeline of the process, please be aware that once there is a deadline, the commission is legally bound to provide um, results within five months. So even for your sake, um, make sure that you know about this timeline. It's not that fast, but it's not that lengthy. So obviously when you consider to apply uh, for a proposal, also consider your 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 capacity at, at one year's time. After that, the uh, evaluation has been concluded within five months and you have been um, successfully informed that you are going to receive the funds, then there is a three month period for the grant agreement preparation, where there and the actual grant agreement is prepared between the commission and the consortium. Obviously, uh, make sure that you are up to speed um, at this stage as well. So, rightly mentioned, there are companies that usually that, um, get involved with the participant portal and they have um, a declared status. So, make sure that at the time of the grant agreement, you are also validated so that you don't find any hiccups in the gr um, grant agreement portal because it may, in a way, affect the whole process. Then the validation is a very um, in a way, simple um, process, which is done actually through the actual portal where you need to submit certain documents to validate your actual um, entity. Next slide. I think that's it. So that, that was, it again, my intervention for today. Thank you very much. Untapped, muted. Hi, Ante. I think it's you're muted. Hey, thank you, Mark. And from my side, I will be I will be uh, uh, going through uh, the role of the national contact points and, and the role of NCT. Skip a number of slides. Okay, so so basically, just to start off, um, uh, I'm just going to uh, go through uh, the structure of the Motor Health for Science and Technology. Um, it is split up into four main units. Um, one of the units is the policy and strategy units, and and this is this is where the, the smart specialization strategies, uh, the R and I strategy for Malta is is is, is created. And also the, 
um, the, the main negotiations with, with the European Union and, and, and the advice of the government on all EU affairs takes place. Um, then we have an internationalization unit which runs uh, other research programs such as, for example, the bilateral Sinoma Alta call, um, the Blue Bio calls, um, the Prima initiative, for instance. Then we have the national R&D unit, which runs the, the Malta's national uh, research and innovation program, the fusion program. And then there is us, the framework program unit, which is the national contact point for uh, the Horizon Europe program. Uh, MCST um, hosts all, all the NCPs under one roof. So it's one office, one stop shop for any queries you have on Horizon Europe. Um, so, so, so basically our role is in space to provide guidance to applicants, to provide practical information and assistance on all aspects of, all, of the participation to the framework program. Applying to, to um, the framework program, framework program is relatively easy, but for newcomers it can, see a bit, it can seem a bit cumbersome. So we are here to help, uh, we are here to assist you if you need any help. Uh, from from beginning to end, so so we run you through the whole process, starting from the really conceptualization stage, and um, when you have, when you have your initial idea, we, we help you to, to connect with other partners. We help you um, to writing the proposal. We help you to budget, um, if, if need be. We help you also um, when when the project is ongoing. If you have any queries, uh, we're here to help. So the main objective of the unit um, is to spread awareness about the project, the, the program, um, giving specialized advice and providing on, on the ground guidance to Maltese applicants. Um, for us, our main goal is obviously to, to have as many, um, tap into as many EU projects as possible. So we are here to provide you all the guidance that you need. Um, how, how do we go about doing this? So, so we circulate uh, general information among our stakeholders. And here I have to stress that um, you become members of our stakeholder community through um, our Facebook page. We have also Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. So there are various channels that you can interact with us. Um, I believe in the, in the slide before the last, um, I will be giving you the links. Um, where you can register either through MCSC website or to our LinkedIn page or to, to our Twitter page or to our Facebook page, for instance. And this is the place where we post um, all the information. So we, we issue newsletters, monthly newsletters, uh, promotional material. Um, we also uh, inform you when calls are opening or closing. Um, when there are partner searches, for instance, we, we, we also also organize some pro promotional activities. We just ended our webinar Wednesday series. So that span over um, two months, two or three months. So um, then again, um, through, through um, these pages, we normally inform you accordingly what events we are organizing. Um, and we also promote other networking events, like for example, EU events where coordinators are participating and that, that could be one of the avenues through which you can find your project for instance so it's very important that 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 you subscribe to these pages um as ncps we 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 provide advice and training uh, we give one-to-one -one consultations with our clients so so any questions that you have um, as you have seen we 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 all have different clusters, we all have different areas. It doesn't matter who your first contact is going to be. Um, the most, I mean, once once a request comes to me and maybe it's not in my area, I, I always delegate it to, to my colleagues who are specifically on that area, but we cover all the areas of the framework program. So, so um, any question that you have, we will be able to answer. Um, we also help in partner searches, so when you are looking for, for a project, for example, or, or a coordinator, or you are coordinating a project and you would like to find partners, um, we can help you do that uh, through our channels. Um, 
with our fellow NCPs in other countries and to our contacts so, so, so we can help you in this regard. Uh, we also provide advice on administrative procedures. So you, when you come to, to apply to the program, there could be some administrative procedures that need to take place and we, we can help you do that. Um, we also review proposals before submission, but we do not uh, review the scientific content. It's more, it's more on the administrative content that we, that we focus. Um, and you also have, um, provide advice during the implementation stage of the project. So if you have any questions, you are there to help. Um, all, all of the NCPs also have a dual role as, as a program committee member. And what, that, what does this mean? Basically, um, we represent Malta in the, in the program committees um, specific to, to the specific areas. So here is the place where uh, the, the work programs are discussed at the political le level and agreed. Um, so, 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 so we try to um, uh, negotiate uh, with the commission uh, the different work programs in different areas so each area each cluster has its own work program so you can imagine the amount of work that goes into into this um basically it's it's about uh, representing the national needs at your level so so we are like the, the um, like the voice of malta in the in the program committees uh, we actively uh, integrate Malta's interests in the consultation. So when, when the work programs are out, we try to tweak them as much as possible in our favor. Um, and we also contribute to shaping the priorities of the relevant work programs according to the national priorities. So we always try to, 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 to find that balance between, between the national interest and also the interests in the work programs. Um, today you've met most of the team. Um, our team is headed by Antea. Um, then uh, we have a number of NCPs, which are Mark, myself, Tamara, and George. And I believe in the coming days you will be meeting with, with Lily with regard to the ERC and the Marie Curie School of Actions. Um, she's not presenting today because she has two dedicated days on her own. So. So, but, but you will be meeting her in the coming days. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's very important to, to engage with us as much as possible. Um, we have uh, many, many portals, many channels through which you can connect with us. If it's LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube. Um, in, in YouTube, for example, you can find all the webinars we've organized for the past two or three months on all the areas which go into specific, like, really, a, a lot of detail um, so, so so you can watch the videos there we have a twitter account so so i really encourage you all to um subscribe uh, to keep up to date with, with all the developments i think this is it um, i'm not sure if there are any questions in the chat box um but but if you have any questions please feel free to uh to to either message us through, through the chat box or to, to intervene. I would be very happy to, to answer any questions you may have. So any questions, everyone? <laughs> so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, all the NCPs for their very elaborate presentations on the new funding schemes and the support which is available. Um, I take also the opportunity to remind you of the support that RSSD offers as well. So um, we work together in identifying the right opportunity for your project idea. And uh, we help with uh, improving the proposal to improve the chances of it being successful. And uh, we offer also training programs and uh, the service of, uh, of, uh, of certain platforms. Uh, in fact, this afternoon, we're going to have uh, a presentation on, the, on our Crowd Helix platform, where it's possible to find uh, partners for your research. 
So yes, please do get in touch with RSSD with your with your ideas, and we'll be happy to support you. Remember that our support is available in different areas, including uh, life sciences, engineering, and ICT, natural sciences, and the arts and humanities. Fantastic. So, um, not sure if any questions came in. No, are there no questions? Um, yeah, so um, we have um, uh, 15 minutes left until our, our next presentation. So if uh, there are no questions, um, I would like to thank once again uh, our national contact point for their contribution to this event. And uh, our next presentation, thank you, Ante. I don't know if Ante would like to say a few words to close your, your presentation. National contact point. Well, maybe the inform it was too much information presented today in uh, one hour, four to five minutes. So if there are any questions that might crop up uh, when you go through the slides, I assume you can share the slides, right, Angie? Yes. Um, so we will make all the slides available on our website together with the recording. So if people were not able to join live, they can follow whenever we want. And everything so, the information will stay there if there would be any other questions um please do let us know um we'd be more than happy to take on any questions by email or how uh, any other method you would like to get in touch with us okay great thank you very much thank you antea thank you to the whole ncp team and uh can so i ask uh, just oh, one yeah. sure Sure, sure. Hi. <laughs> Hello, hi. Luca. Hi. Um, I just want to ask if I look for something like sustainable um, tourism in uh, small islands, um, and I think there isn't anything, um, any project in particular like this, I mean, this specific, uh, is it possible to, to find like a larger project and have like a sub project, or it's really like uh, like any horizon project or any other type of funding, it's really like uh, like specific on a topic. Just as an as an example uh, for my case. Um, it depends on on the role. So would this be if it's on a, something which is already funded? Um, uh, if it's not, it has to be within the topic. Um, this would fall probably under cluster two, which is under the culture um, work program. Um, if it's not within the topic, you can get in touch with us because now uh, in the coming months, we will also start discussing um, work programs for 2023, 2024. So if there would be a lot of interest in that topic, we can also start lobbying with other countries, um, maybe countries which are similar to us, Mediterranean countries, Sorry. and we can lobby for some, some similar topic um, to be featured in, in an upcoming uh, work program. I see. Uh, can I ask you, Iceland is included in the member countries or not? Or it's like Iceland is considered as an associated country. Associated, okay. Um, they are still um, trying negotiating their um, uh, association agreement because none, uh, as far as I'm aware, none of the associated countries have concluded their association agreements. Um, but this should be finalized by uh, this summer or late uh, in the beginning of autumn. But they can still, of course, apply for uh, for for projects. So it it would be included in the three participating countries. Uh, if their is association agreement is in place um, by uh, the deadline, it will be considered um, as one of those minimum three criteria. But as we have mentioned before, it might be better to have other countries just in case um, okay, the association plan. agreement does not go through. Which I, I doubt it will not go through, but it's better to play safe in, in such circumstances. And in the Maybe like if it's not sustainable tourism, then it would be possible to tweak the, the theme. So for example, like uh, employment inclusion in uh, uh, 
in certain countries, so for example, Malta, that would be a widening uh, area and so on, that would be possible then tweaking the, the topic. Rather than tweaking the po topic, I mean, because when you have um, uh, topics which are already set in the work program, it is important mm -hmm. to follow those uh, topics, those okay. uh, suggestions which are already made. But there are other areas which uh, which you can go through, like the areas which are bottom up. Um, for example, the widening area, the mm -hmm. um, which Ian spoke about, it's a bottom yeah. up area. So where you have to propose the area which you are proposing for uh, for collaboration. Okay. But maybe we can take this uh, this uh, query uh, on a one to one basis and speak further with you to see what you actually have in mind to see whether your area would fit more properly. Sure, sure. We'll be in contact. Thank you. Uh, and Thank you one for a question. <laughs> Just one thing. It's like uh, if I if I'm a PhD student and I finish next year, then would it be a problem uh, if I'm not associated with the university uh, and I'm still in a project? How does it work in that sense? So you mean you are in a project right now and uh, no, you... like let's say that I, uh, I I can start a project, but I finish my PhD next year like uh, September 2022, then I would be excluded from the project, from the EU Horizon project, for example, or uh, how does it work? Um, it depends which part, because there are some um, areas which are for the individual researchers. But if you get into a project um, on behalf of the, let's say the University of Malta, then you have to make sure that uh, you get uh, an agreement with the University of Malta that they will continue um, supporting you until the project is all finished because the University of Malta then has to finish that project. It, uh, it, so it would be either you as the researcher who will continue working on that project or otherwise they will have to find a replacement to who will continue doing the work um, because the University of Malta is signing the grant agreement. So it is um, signing and de declaring that it was going to continue the work until uh, until it finishes. I understand, okay. So I will have to agree with the Institute basically and so on. Okay, understood, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I think there's someone online who's raising their hand. Okay. Okay. Hi, um, Mira, um, okay. from the, of Mira. the Department of Nursing. Hi. First of all, thank you for this very interesting presentation and very informative. Uh, one practical question. If um, one is not actively looking, as you showed us, to search for, uh, for collaborators whatsoever in a project, is there a way um, that one could receive some alerts in an area that um, I, for example, am interested, some alerts of, of some, some partners that are uh, looking for collaborators, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so just that practical question. Thank you. Um, as Ian have mentioned, we use a lot of uh, our social media. Um, we also have like a newsletter, so you can subscribe to our newsletter and you can receive updates on that particular area. So if you are interested in health, as you mentioned, you will receive any updates from that uh, specific area. For example, like if there are any new topics published in that area, if there, are, if we have received any partner searches in that area, you can directly subscribe to that area. Um, and then you will be kept updated on, uh, on obviously on, on that area. And also um, we utilize the social media as much as possible. So any such notifications are made public as much as possible. But uh, please feel free to subscribe to our um, uh, our mailing list. So as I mentioned, you will receive all notifications from from that area directly to to your inbox. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? We have just four more minutes. <laughs> 
And well, if not, so again, once again, thank you for your very detailed presentation and for your support. And yes, we'll keep in touch. Looking forward to collaborate together. Thank you also for, for inviting us to, to participate um, at this session. <laughs> pleasure, pleasure.